Five years. Yeah. Keep that. Keep the string going. Welcome back. We just had a test in this uh, class, and um, by the way, I haven't started to grade those, but. When, as soon as I get this stuff turned in for next fall, then I'll start to grade those today. What I usually do is I'll return them as I grade them, so I don't wait till I get them all graded. So if I have half the class graded tomorrow, then I don't see any reason to hold those back till the other half are graded. I'll just hand those out with a solution sheet. Once everybody gets their test back, we'll talk about it. Uh, I will tell you, uh, a couple of you, at the end of class Friday, I mentioned this too. Every problem that was on that test was in your textbook. So I don't know if you've seen it by going through the chapter reviews or a, you know, a problem actually from WebAssign, uh, but every problem on that test, and I'll point it out to you if you have a question about that when you get it back, was a problem from your textbook. A lot of times I look in the chapter review, uh, and sometimes I don't find problems that I think are kind of middle-of-the-road test type questions, but in this case I found them. And some of you asked me questions during the test. First of all, I would never give you a partial fractions decomposition problem that had like negative 11 seventeenths for the A or the B or the C value. I just, I mean, I'm not the nicest person on the planet, but I'm not mean. No, it wasn't. No, see, doggone it, you missed that, right? Um, but I mean, they were integers. In fact, what I do is I'll go from the decomposed part back to the single fraction so that I, that way I'm guaranteed that they're integers. Um, so probably says that something's gone haywire when, when that happens. Um, another problem that kind of, I really thought this was a gift and, and many of you rejected my gift, um, which happens to me all the time first time I saw the problem, and this I know this was a problem from the book, it had the uh, e to the x here. So the way I started to do the problem, um, I was thinking, so I, I kind of started this out, let u equal e to the x, and in my mind I'm thinking that's u. Because it kind of looks like a u, right? If u is e to the x, knowing that the real reason I chose u was that this was u squared, right? e to the 2x is the same thing as e to the x squared. So there's my u squared, which is kind of what prompted me to make this choice when I looked at this problem to see if I thought it was a fair test question. And then I'm saying, okay, well, there's a u. Well, du, if u is e to the x, du is also e to the x. So then that e to the x is needed. So actually, when I wrote it on your test, not that this is any big major hint, but I actually wrote it with the e to the x after so that, that you would not be tempted or be less tempted to call that u. And then when you discovered this out here at the end, you'd say, well, okay, there it is. du is all at the end of the problem. So this is 1 minus u squared. In fact, that was on the table of integrals. That was the first one, right? I don't know what number it was, 30, maybe 30, OK? Was, this was the very first formula because it was, a squared minus u squared. So I tried to kind of take that from the form it was in the book and, and send it out there to the right and maybe maybe you think it look a little bit more like du as opposed to just a u that's out here floating around by itself. But I saw uh, a couple of you asked me some questions during the test that um, you had it going way different than that and it was way more complicated than that. So I, I really don't necessarily try to do that to you on a test. Uh, the syllabus, let's take a look at that and where we are in kind of some options that we have. Um, so section 6.5 
is applications uh, dealing with physics problems and engineering problems. It probably, to do justice to this section in the textbook, it's probably going to take us all week. So we have some options, 6.6 .6 or 6.7. Um, notice what they say in parentheses, or more 6.5. If we have time, probably not 6.6, .6, maybe some 6.7, uh, although I've never gotten to that before in this course. Um, 6.7 deals with something that I'm sure all of you are very familiar with is the normal distribution, the bell-shaped curve. And when you deal with how, many, how much of the area is within one standard deviation of the mean and how much is it within two standard deviations of the mean, I mean, that's kind of basic statistics class stuff, isn't it? Are you taking statistics? No. And then how much is within three standard deviations? Does anybody, if this is an, a bell-shaped curve and we're going one standard deviation here and here, how much of the kind of the population of this normal distribution does that capture? Does anybody recall that? Sixty-eight percent. Sixty-eight percent. Okay. And we, these are some things we could validate with calculus. If you go two standard deviations from the mean, it captures how much of the area under this curve? Ninety-five. And if you go three standard deviations from the mean, 90, 99, okay, right around 99%. So these are some things that, you know, in a statistics class, you've been told this, but in, if we get to this in a math class, we can actually take the equation and find out the area under the curve and, you know, how sure can we be uh, based on what one standard deviation is for that particular distribution um, that we can be within so many standard deviations of the mean. So that's actually 6.7. Uh, I don't know if we'll get there or not. We'll kind of see how the week goes. There are a lot of applications in 6.5. And let's start 6.5. And you might just kind of, as we get to new types of applications, it's almost like a completely new section in the book. So you might want to kind of, what you normally do when you go from 6.3 to 6.4, kind of make a mark in your notes that this is a new type of problem. We have several new types of problems, even though they all fall under this big umbrella of work. So some things that um, we can either see for the first time, or hopefully it's review for most of you. Um, what force is, force, which we're going to need because we're going to take a, an examination of little, I know it sounds stupid in a way, little pieces of work. And then we'll use integral calculus. I mean, you've seen somebody that's a piece of work, right? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about actual descriptions of work and we'll analyze that little incremental piece of work and then use integral calculus to tell us how much work is done. So in doing so, we're going to need force and distance. So um, let's talk about what force could be in some of the units. So force can be mass times acceleration. We've seen that and we've used that. Now the different units that we could have, um, the ones that are the most stubborn, and I, I'm by no means, I'm not um, fluent in these units, but I've come across them enough where I recognize them. I don't actually have a wonderful handle on what, what a, uh, a Newton is and what a Newton meter is, other than it's a joule, okay? Um, I, I don't really have a great handle on that um, like I do with a foot pound. I mean, a foot pound is, you know, the force it takes to move something that's one pound one foot. I, I just have a better handle on that. But um, when, we, when we take force, and if it's mass times acceleration, well, we know what acceleration is. It's the second derivative of the distance, height, or position function, the S of t function, with respect to t both times. 
So mass could be in kilograms, and if our mass is in kilograms, then we multiply that by an acceleration constant that then is in a, another unit, which is meters per second squared, and we end up with this strange unit, kilogram meters per second squared, which is a newton. So somebody that has a really good handle on what a newton really is, enlighten me this morning on this handle that you have on what a newton is. <coughs> no, no enlightenment this morning? Hopefully you have a better handle on what a newton is than I do. Um, then, if we convert um, work, which is what we really want, into force times distance, and this, this is what we look at incremental pieces of. Yeah, I agree. It's, it's really hot. It, Chandler, if we can just prop the door open and see if we can get something that we're not all going to be just rolling in sweat here at the end of class. I mean, it is work, right? So, I mean, we should have a little bit of sweat going because we're talking about work. But we don't, you know, might get a little stinky in here. So if work is force times distance, we'll see how much force is required to stretch or compress the spring or move this particular slice of water to this height. Uh, and then we'll figure out incrementally what the distance is that it's going to move, little delta x's at a time or little delta y's at a time. Then we'll convert it to an integral calculus problem. But basically, we're going to need force. Well, force might be mass times acceleration. Especially if we're given something in kilograms, we're going to have to convert it to that. And then we want to analyze how far that object is being moved incrementally, little dx's or little dy's at a time. So this could be feet. Sorry, this could be pounds. And this could be feet. And if it's that way, it's pretty darn simple then our work required would be foot-pounds. Okay, if our force happens to be, like we have up here, kilogram meters per second squared, and let's say this is meters, then we've got an even stranger sounding unit, kilogram meters per second squared times meters, or this we decided was newtons, right? So this is newtons times meters, so a newton meter is a joule, okay? And if you have a really good handle on what a joule is, then please enlighten me. I, I, there is a nice conversion. What is it? A joule is 1.36 foot-pounds, I think, is the conversion. That helps me, but as far as... Um, <coughs> So if we have newton meters, then we have joules. So we do have to kind of pay attention to the nature of what we're given. If it's a force required to move something or stretch or compress something, that is in terms of pounds, we're good, just let it go. We want feet, probably. You could have inch pounds, I guess, too, but normally it's foot pounds. And pay attention if we've got um, newtons and meters, then we'll convert it to joules. All right, so how simple can work be without integral calculus? First example, and we don't need calculus to do it, so we have a book that is 1.2 kilograms. It's on the floor. We want to, the amount of work required to bring that book to a height of 0.7 meters. So work being force times distance, nothing real mysterious or complicated about this problem. We've got a, let's get agreement here, to move a book that um, 
is 1.2 kilograms. I guess it's a little tougher to think about that. You think of it, does it, how much force does it require to move that book? Well, we've got to convert that to a force, first of all. So we know that it requires that much force to move that book or lift that book. So if it's kilograms, which it is, we've got to convert that to something here that's going to occupy this capital F position, the force position, so that it actually is converted to a force rather than just a mass. So if we've got mass, we need to multiply it by acceleration. And in terms of meters per second squared, what is acceleration? The gravitational constant associated with acceleration. 9.8. 9.8. So that would be a handy thing to hang on to if you haven't come across that in a physics class. Uh, acceleration due to gravity, 9.8 meters per second per second. What would that look like if we needed to use that acceleration constant, which in pounds we don't, but if we needed it somewhere down the road, what's it look like in feet? 32. 32 feet per second per second, right? So now we've converted that to a force. So the force required to move that book is this. And then how far are we going to move it? To a height of 0.7 meters. So that's the distance we're going to move it. We could set up an integral, integral calculus problem to do this, but it's, it's just way too simple to rely on calculus to do it. So the unit, here we're going to have kilogram meters per second squared, newtons, times meters, which would be newton, newton meters, which is joules. And it's the product of this number times this number times this number, right? Force times distance. So that should be, if I, my arithmetic is right here, 8.2. Somebody correct me if that's not what you get when you multiply those three units. 8.2 joules is the work. All right, let's take another simple non-calculus example. Um, let's say we have something that weighs 20 pounds and we want to move it six feet. So the force required to move 20 pounds is 20 pounds of force. And if we want to use, move it six feet, there's our distance. So the work done in this situation required to move something that weighs 20 pounds Six feet would be 120 foot-pounds. No calculus. Now, let's take this one. And I don't know how much this is worth, but it's probably worth a minute or two of class time. Suppose we wanted to make a real simple integral calculus problem out of this one. So we're going to move 20 pounds. We're not going to be able to, like, if it, let's say it's a, a dumbbell, and we want to move 20 pounds, well, you're not going to be able to, like, partition it up and move it one or two or five or seven pounds at a time. It's 20 pounds. We've got to move the whole thing. But we can look at the distance we're going to move it incrementally. If you're going to move it six feet total, can you move it one inch and then another inch and then another inch? When you get done, won't, won't you have done the same work as if you just picked it up and placed it up here? six feet. So we can't incrementally look at the force required, but we can incrementally look at the distance you're going to move it. So there we go. Okay, 20 is the force. Let's say we're going to move it and let's look at this vertical movement. We're going to lift it up a total of six feet. So we want to lift it up little increments at a time, little delta y's at a time. And then we want to add together all of those, moving 20 pounds, little increments of y each time, from 
wherever it started, we'll call that y equals zero, to a position six feet above y equals zero. So we could take this problem, don't do this because it doesn't make any sense to make the problem more difficult, but we're converting it so that it could be an integral calculus problem. So I know it's not 20 delta y, we would call that 20 dy. But I guess the purpose of spending a couple minutes is that here's the force. That dy is really a delta y, which is really the distance. So 20 is in pounds, 0 to 6, those are y values and they're in feet. Well, if you integrate 20 with respect to y, what do you get? 20y. And if you evaluate that from 0 to 6, you get the same answer. Again, no reason to use integral calculus. Just take 20, multiply it by 6. 120 foot-pounds, but integral calculus does work on this problem. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to analyze the force needed, and it could be a variety of things, stretch or compress a spring to actually physically move something, look at the incremental pieces of distance, and then see if we can decide where to start the process and where to end the process. I don't think this is from your book. Um, these things are mentioned in your book. But this is, in essence, what we're doing in this first box. Is This is the force required to move this or stretch this or compress this. So the work done in moving an object from the point with coordinate A to the point with coordinate B is this. These little delta X's or delta Y's are the incremental breakdowns of the distance. Uh, this is, I don't think this notation is used in this book. Um, that capital P with it looks like double absolute value brackets, brackets is, is actually called the norm of the partition. And if the norm of the partition is approaching zero, that kind of is the fattest subinterval, the widest delta x. Then if the fattest one or widest one is approaching zero, then certainly the ones that aren't so fat or aren't so wide, they're also approaching zero. So this just says that whatever we've incrementalized, if that's a word, they're all practically zero. Little, we're going to move it little delta y's, or in this case, little delta x's, that are just little bitty distances each time we move it. So what does that become? What does that look like? That pretty much looks like the definition of what a definite integral actually is, and that's what we're going to be doing. Here's the force. Here's the distance incrementalized. Where does it start? Where does it stop? Now we're going to do a uh, spring problem. So let's take a look at Hooke's law before we do the spring problem. I know this is in your reading, but I don't think it's, kind of, it's framed out exactly this way. There is a description in sentence form of what Hooke's law is. So let's read it, and then we'll try to put that into our own terms. The force, f of x, so we are going to deal with force because it's going to be in the integrand. So this force, f of x, required to stretch, and you could put or compress, depending on the nature of the spring problem. If the spring is able to be compressed, it takes just as much work to compress it as it does to stretch it from its natural length. So the force, f of x, required to stretch or compress a spring, x units beyond its natural length is given by this. So it's a pretty simple linear relationship. So the force is some constant times x. Well, what is x? x is the number of units it has been stretched or compressed from its natural length. k is called the spring constant. x we can call its, I don't know, I've seen it described as its elongation. 
So the force required to stretch or compress a spring is some constant times its elongation. So think about a spring for a second. If you've already stretched a spring out, so we're already beyond its natural length, isn't it more difficult to stretch it even further? Right? So the force, it's going to take more force to stretch it even further because it's already elongated so many inches or centimeters or meters beyond its natural length. So the K is the same. The reason it requires more force is because it's already stretched beyond its natural length. So the force required to stretch or compress a spring is directly proportional to its elongation. This is how we'll analyze that in terms of a spring problem. All right, let's look at one in terms of Newtons. Uh, is this example in your book? If it's not, there's one similar to it. This is in your book, and then we'll do one that's not in your book. So this is actually on page 472. It says a force of 40 newtons is required to hold a spring that has been stretched from its natural length of 10 centimeters. Centimeters are not good if we put them together with newtons. We don't want newton centimeters. We want newton meters, so we're going to have to convert that to meters. Force of 40 newtons is required to hold a spring that has been stretched from its natural length of 10 centimeters to a length of 15 centimeters. Why do they give us that statement? Why do they tell us how much force is required to hold this spring in its stretched position five centimeters beyond its natural length. So, you find the spring constant. so we can find the spring constant. So that's in the first sentence. Okay? <laughs> so the force, what is the force required in this first sentence? Forty mm -hmm. newtons. So we don't know K, that's what we're searching for. And a force of 40 newtons is required to hold a spring that has been stretched from its natural length of 10 centimeters to a length of 15 centimeters. So what's the elongation? Five, Five centimeters. centimeters. Five centimeters. What are we going to call that? Point zero, 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 five. Centimeter is a one, one hundredth of a meter, right, with the prefix C-E-N-T-I? So that would be 0 0.05, right, meters? Now, the constant in this case has a funny unit, but let's just keep track of the fact that when we're done, we're dealing with meters and newtons, so we're probably going to have joules for an answer. So K is equal to what? So this is what we're solving for. 40 divided by 0.05, 800, <coughs> is that right? So we have our K, so the work, that's what we want to do. We want to analyze the work done. I guess I should read the rest of the problem so we know what we're actually searching for. How much work is done in stretching the spring from 15 centimeters to 18 centimeters? So here's what the work is, kind of generically. Well, f of x in this case is k times x, and we know what that is. There's k, there's x. So our little increments of distance, kind of, we're stretching this spring little delta x's at a time. From what starting position to what ending position? So it's all related to the natural length of the spring. So we're going to stretch it from a length of 15 centimeters. What's our starting position? Related to the natural length. Point zero 0.05. Is that right? So we're 
starting 0 0.05 meters beyond the natural length, and we're ending how much beyond the natural length? With zero zero eight. Point zero 0.08. Does that work? So this is units beyond the natural length. If, the, if we're starting from natural length, that's position zero, kind of its equilibrium. But we're not there. We're starting 0 0.05 meters beyond the natural length, ending at 0 0.08 meters beyond the natural length. The calculus problems are not going to be difficult, so we'll just kind of, once we're there, we've got 800, we're integrating x, so that's x squared over 2, 0.05 to 0 0.08. Let me see if I have my arithmetic down here. I think I do. Uh, if you analyze this at 0.08, squared, divide by 2, multiply by 800, same thing here, and subtract them. I have written down 1.56, and this should be joules. Does that work? Where did the extra x come from? Because the force required to stretch or compress a spring is directly proportional to the elongation. So here's our force in this problem. On a spring problem, that's what the force is going to look like. Some spring constant times x, this linear relationship. So the further you stretch it, the more force is required. And how much, more for, how much additional force is required, it's a linear relationship. That spring constant times x. All right, let's look at one that is not, and I thought I had one written down. I don't, so I'll just make one up. So let's say a spring has a natural length of 13 inches, and let's say that we have a description. Let's say that... Um, that it takes a force of 20 pounds. Actually, let's make this a little different, OK? Let's not kind of stretch it like we're doing the stretching. So let's put a 20-pound weight. Use your imagination. That's a spring, OK? So there's the spring at its natural length, OK? This is 13 inches. Again, use your imagination. So we put a 20-pound weight. at the end of that spring, and it stretches the spring, I don't know, four inches. <laughs> four inches beyond its natural length. So the fact that we put a 20-pound weight on here and it stretches the spring four inches beyond its natural length, that gives us our equation from Hooke's Law. Force required to stretch or compress the spring is directly proportional to the elongation. So the force is 20 pounds. K we're searching for, and X is the elongation, which was actually given in that format, right? We didn't have to figure it out. It stretched it four inches. Uh, do we want inches? I don't know if I want inches, because then we're going to have a final answer of inch pounds. Uh, I don't know if I want that. So let's convert this, okay? So we've still got 20 pounds, and 4 inches can be what? A third of a foot. A third of a foot. That way, when we're done with the problem, we have a more convenient unit, which would be foot pounds. So what is K in this problem? 60. 60? <coughs> so regardless of what we do in this problem, we've got our spring constant. 
we know the force is some k times x. We know we're going to move this little delta x's at a time. Let's say how much work is required to stretch it from its natural length. to a length of 21 inches. So what would we call natural length? Zero. 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 Call it zero. Zero feet, so that's its equilibrium. So we put this weight on the end, it stretches it, we figured out the spring constant. Now we want to be able to stretch it. How much force is it going to take to stretch it? from its natural length to a length of 21 inches. Well, what are we going to call 21 inches? <coughs> so it's 21 twelfths, right? But, and what is that? I thought it was one and three quarters. Is it one and three quarters? Yeah. yeah. Three be seven fourths, right? Let's just call it seven fourths. So from zero, feet to a position that is one and three quarters feet. Now it's all related to its natural length. So there's our integral calculus problem. Yes, sir. If we're going to stretch it to a length of 21 from the natural 13, right. the difference would only be... Oh, that's what I want. Yeah. Okay, yeah. sorry. That's what I want. I told you that I, I kind of lose my train of thought today. We, did, we just lost it. Let's regain it here. Natural length, so that's going to be position zero, because that's 13 inches already. That's its equilibrium. To a length of 21 inches, how much beyond the natural length is that? That's what we need. Thank you. So beyond the natural length, that is Seven eight inches. Eight. 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 So what is 8 inches in terms of feet? <coughs> two thirds. It is 2 thirds? Mm -hmm. So thank you for catching that. Hopefully we would have caught that before we left it. But 13 inches is where it already <coughs> is. That's equilibrium <coughs> position 0. We want to go to 21 inches. How much beyond the natural length is that? Two-thirds of a foot. Now we're good, right? So we would integrate 60x squared over 2, evaluate from 0 to two-thirds. I just made up the problem, so I don't have the answer. But it doesn't take a whole lot to get this answer. Put in two-thirds, square it, right? Four ninths, multiply it by 30. What is that? 13 and a third. 13 and a third. And the units? Foot pounds. Foot pounds. Okay, I think we can start this one. I don't know that we can finish it. All right, here's our diagram. See, now I'm, I don't know your names yet. No, I'm in trouble. I'll just have to call on the four people I know. See, that's trouble that you're back here again. Um, here is a conical tank. I don't think this example is in your book. One similar to it is in your book. Um, this one is not in your book. A right circular conical tank of altitude 20 feet and base radius 5 feet has its vertex at ground level. That kind of helps it hold water if the vertex at the ground because if it were the other way it probably would struggle holding water. And its axis is vertical. Now, probably we don't have a lot of right circular cone tanks, okay? But we can take this procedure 
and I think it'll help us solve a lot of other problems that maybe aren't conical in nature. If the tank is full of water, and we'll also look at problems when it's not full, when it's full to a certain point, but the first example is probably easiest to look at it when it's full of water. Find the work done in pumping the water out over the top of the tank. So we've got this cone, base radius five feet, it's 20 feet tall, it's full of water, and we want to analyze the work done in pumping the water out to the top of the tank. Now, this already has the slice of water pictured. Why do we need to analyze different slices of water different from some other slice of water? Well, this particular slice that's here to take this slice to the top of the tank, don't we have to take it this far? Right? Whereas another slice of water down here, even though there's less water in that particular slice, doesn't it have to travel further to get to the top of the tank? So we've got some variable weights, if you want to call them that, because there's the weight of this slice is different from the weight of this slice. Not only are the weights different, the distances they have to travel are also different. So we have to describe those in terms of the variables that we've been given in this problem. All right, so we've got feet, 20 feet tall and a base radius of 5 feet. The tank is full of water. Find the work done in pumping the water over the top of the tank. So um, what about the, since we've got feet and feet, what about the weight or density, if you want to call it that, of water? Does anybody remember what that is? I've actually seen two different units, um, 62.4 pounds per cubic foot and 62.5 pounds per cubic foot. So let me see what they want us to use here. Try to be consistent with this book. And I'm not seeing it right away. Sixty-two point five. Do you see it in this book? Yeah, 474 on the side. Left side, um, small script. Okay, there we dots. go. Yeah. Page 474. So we'll use their version, 62.5 pounds per cubic foot. Now, if we're careful with our units, too, we can actually kind of see what the answer is going to be by talking about, you know, here's feet, here's another, so we have foot, feet times feet, that's square feet, and then we have another incremental distance involved, linear distance, it's feet again, so we can actually keep track of the units. So do you feel confident that if we describe how much water is in this slice, not just the volume of that water, that's going to play a part, but the weight of that water, and then we figure out how far we have to move this amount of water, wouldn't that same thing work for this also? As long as we describe it generically, and then we'll add them all up. Here we are back to that little incremental model again. So we're going to add up all of the work, plural, works, involved in moving each slice of water to the top of the tank. So let's look at the one that was actually pictured for us. How much water is there in that little slice? What is that little slice? If you had to describe that, what is that? Cylinder. It's a cylinder, right? Short, little, squatty cylinder. Well, what's the volume of a cylinder? Yeah. 
So the slice is really a cylinder. Volume of a cylinder? Pi r squared? H, we've already used that, right? Earlier in chapter 6. Okay, I think we can do that. Can you describe the radius? Actually, it probably would be better down here because then we'd be going to the curve. They've got it marked out here. Either way, we've got this thing looking pretty thick or pretty tall. It's actually a whole lot thinner than that, right, if we do the process right. So this distance and this distance, we're talking about the same thing. This doesn't actually go all the way to the edge of the cone, but in reality, there's no difference because it's so thin. So what do you call the distance from the y-axis over to a point on the curve, which in this case is a line? That's its x value, right? So the radius is x, can be described by x. Does that work down here also? Is the radius of that slice also described as x? Okay, so every slice that we have, the radius could be described as x. How about the height or thickness of each slice? Y. A little delta y, a little incremental y, and you can see that right here. There's the delta y. There's the x sub i, so depending on where we are, it's an x value for that particular slice. So eventually in the integrand, that's going to become a dy. So let's finish, because we're about out of time, but let's finish with how much does that slice of water or any slice of water actually weigh? Well, we know how much water is there, pi r squared h. That's the volume. What do we do to the volume to get convert it so that it's actually how much force it's going to take to move that slice? Well, what are our units thus far? We said the radius was x. The height, x is in feet, right? So there's feet squared. Delta y is also in feet. So we've got feet squared times feet, which is feet cubed. What do we need to multiply by so that we know how much force it takes to move this slice? Something that has feet cubed. We've got to get rid of cubic feet. We've generated feet squared times feet. We've generated cubic feet. We've got to get rid of that unit, right? And we want it to be a force, so we want it to be, what, pounds? How many pounds of force are we going to take, is it going to take to move that slice of water? So feet cubed reduces with feet cubed, and we're left with pounds. Does that sound like a force to you? Yes. Sounds like a force to me. So this is part of our integrand. I said we'd stop there, so we will. What else do we need in the integrand, which we're not going to get till tomorrow? The distance. We need distance, right? And the distance of each slice is different, so we have to describe that in terms of what it takes to move each slice, but we'll pick up from this point tomorrow.